Namaste and good morning to one and all present here. I am Vanna Siddharth, the media and outreach manager of SCLHR. And I Kritika Mehmet, the principal secretary of SCLHR. Heartily welcome you all on behalf of SCLHR to the guest lecture on internet shutdowns and the principle of proportionality. I warm heartedly welcome our esteemed guest speaker, Mr. Appa Gupta, its founding director, Internet Freedom Foundation, on behalf of our entire society for constitutional law and human rights. Thank you, sir, for gracing the occasion with your presence. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Shikha Dibli, ma'am, and everyone else present here today for this guest lecture that we are presenting. Before taking, I would like to introduce you all to our university. UPES is a university comprising eight schools that provide education in engineering, computer science, de uh, design, health sciences, modern media, liberal arts, management, and law. UPS <coughs> is an NAAC accredited A grade institution certified with five star ratings in the categories of employability, academic development, program strength, and facilities. Talking about School of Law. School of Law at UPS is a beacon of legal education in India. Our curriculum is thoughtfully designed using interactive learning methodologies and delivered by leading experts in their respective fields. We offer a state-of-the-art infrastructure featuring an in-house mood board for immersive learning experience learning. These concerted efforts have contributed to the law school's prestigious 52nd ranking in the NIRF ranking list for legal education. Talking a few words about our society before we move on with the event. Society for Constitutional Law and Human Rights was established on the auspicious day of 15 August of 2018 under the esteemed AGS of UPES School of Law. Society for Constitutional Law and Human Rights is one of the only student established societies in the college. And also, the ARC Society is committed to fostering research and expanding students' understanding on evolving legal landscape of the Constitution. Our guest lecture series aims to give a dynamic platform that strives to generate awareness on crucial matters pertaining to comparative constitutional law and human rights. This platform allows us to delve into profound concepts of constitutionalism, constitutional morality, and application of constitution in the contemporary society. I would like to take a couple of minutes to introduce you all to our guest. Uh, there is indeed so much to add to Sir's experience and journey. Sir is a lawyer, advocate, and the executive director of the Internet Freedom Foundation. The IFF is an Indian digital liberties organization that seeks to ensure that technology respects fundamental rights. He has completed his postgraduate studies from the Columbia University School of Law and has practiced and is practicing since more than a decade. After graduation, he also worked as a commercial litigator in top law firms such as Karanja Wala & Co and was a partner at Advani & Co. During this period, he also represented a diverse set of clients from India's top corporate groups, high net worth individuals and public sector units, even being retained as a counsel for the government of India in the high courts of Delhi. He also continues to write opens and journal articles for the Indian Express, the Hindu, the IIC quarterly and seminar, etc. He has also written a book on the IT Act 2000, 2000 published by the Lexis Nexis. He was also a part of key constitutional challenges on Section 66A, the right to privacy and Aadhaar representing public interest litigants. He has worked extensively with activist, activists and set up digital campaigns such as those on net neutrality, fight against def, uh, defamation laws and safeguard privacy. He is committed to advance values of the Constitution of India in a digital technology mediated society. We are extremely honored to have you amongst us, sir. Now I would like to request Dr. Shikardi ma'am to come over here and facilitate our guest with the memento on behalf of our society.
Before we move on, I'd like to just give all, everyone present here a, a brief on why we are having this guest lecture today on this very particular topic. Internet shutdown is a very important, internet is a very important aspect of every person's life in the present generation. And India is ranked second on the global internet shutdown ranking. Also recently, the events that have been taking in Manipur, we have seen that there have been prolonged internet shutdowns there, causing a lot of human rights violations and constitutional violations in this particular nation. And to address these particular constitutional aspects of these particular problems that have been taking place in our nation, Mr. Appa Gupta Sir is here to address these problems and help us gain knowledge on these particular concepts of constitutional law and human rights. Lecture on this very topic that is internet shutdowns and the principle of proportion. Before we move on with Mr. Appar Gupta for coming on the stage, I would just like to announce that this session is going to be an interactive session and there will be gifts given at the end a book, 10 judgments. Yeah, 10 judgments that changed India as a gift to the ones who have participated actively in this particular guest lecture. Thank you, sir. Now you may take the Thank you, sir. Thank so, thank you so much for having me here. And uh, uh, please be uh, free to blame me for this being held on a Saturday because uh, your conveners of the society did suggest uh, the weekdays to be much more convenient days, but my travel plans did not uh, allow me to come during the weekday. So I take all blame, and I hope that since you have come on a Saturday to hear me, I'm able to provide some value, some perspective, not only on the topic, but also as your journey through law school. So I, I heard that uh, just before when I came was, that uh, there was a moot court competition. How many of you participated in it yesterday? Okay, so congratulations to all of you. And uh, yeah. most of my law school actually was spent in moot court competitions, and that's uh, something which I did uh, because it interested me as a much more practical form of application of skill. And uh, but one thing which we noticed, at least when moot courts were a big thing, was uh, there was an inherent element of uh, competitiveness which enters into you. Right? You always want to be number one. But I'll just tell you one story uh, about my own life. Is that uh, when I participated in my first moot court competition, I didn't win. Actually, uh, I I got I got the third rank and a certificate, and I tore that up. And one of my friends actually, Ayush Kapoor, who's a partner now in CAM, he actually retains that certificate till date and he put it together with a tape. And he reminds me till date, this is who you are. Okay? Because it's important for you sometimes also not to be number one, but to lose gracefully and to improve yourself. After that, I participated in eight or nine internal moot court competitions, and I was not selected to represent my law school. So there was no cap on the number of uh, moot courts you could go for in Amity, right? Uh, so I had to participate in every internal, okay? And I progressively became so good that by the end of fifth year, I was coaching, I was trusted by my batchmates to coach them for a Stetson competition in which we won the uh, uh, nationals and we went to the international and we were ranked fourth there. So, it's not bad. Okay. so all of this is possible, but it, uh, please don't clap every time. <laughs> 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 so yeah, but is, so what, what I'm trying to put across to you, it's not the start or the end of the world. Please view it in a very small perspective of your life as a attempt towards learning something and hopefully learning something in a group with others, okay? The most important thing from a law school will be a Ayush Kapoor, will be a person who keeps that certificate which you tore and you throw away as a very beautiful memory of you misbehaving something, okay? So look for that friend, okay? That's more important than moon codes, okay? So I'm just starting with the lecture right now, 
Okay, I came to uh, internet shutdowns because of my own early access to the internet, and the internet has been something which has allowed me to become who I am. It's allowed me to express myself. It's allowed me to form really deep personal relationships, and also to become the person who I am in the true sense of the word. For instance, that when we started accessing the internet in the late 90s, it was very different from what it is today. It was not four or five websites, it was not smartphones and a bunch of applications which were nested there. It was a bit more of an open field in which you used to not open 100 tabs, but you did end up going to 100 different websites and very small blogs and uh, little nooks and corners. It wasn't that commercialized. It wasn't that developed in that sense. So in a way, it left a lot to curiosity, exploration, and that led to our interest being developed over a period of time. Not to say that today is not any better in that sense, but the degree of dependence which has grown over the internet is not only for personality development. It's for interpersonal relationships. Yes, it's there. So it is a networking technology but it is also a core method to service for the services a human being needs for participating in a modern digital society, which is access to the internet for you as students, for instance, during COVID, it must have been remote education, right? For people uh, who are working, it would have been uh, work from home, which is still something which many people do, it's hybrid work from home in some way or the other for banking transactions to take place, for most of our UPI payments to go through, and uh, for health services to be provided in a timely manner, right? So, when we started working on the issue of internet shutdowns by itself, there were two or three objections which were made. The first objection which was made was that it's essentially a service which is given as a privilege because most people who access the internet happen to be from higher economic groups, Okay, they happen to be people who are English speaking, uh, who have the ability to pay about uh, five to six thousand, eight thousand rupees, own a desktop computer, and these people only use it basically for downloading music, or for watching movies. So, what's the use, right, of posting on social media? So, if we can prevent a riot, if we can prevent the loss of life, right? Your, your convenience, your ability to entertain yourself should not result in any interference to it. And you can see this around the time even when your society would have been formed on August, 9th, uh, August 15th, 2019, which is, I think, uh, also the date IFF was on, or 2018, right? 18, right? Um, so yeah, so more or less, that was the first objection. The second objection was that when we shut down the internet by itself, it's a precautionary measure of administrative control which the state always has, right? And uh, it's not as if it's, uh, uh, it's not possible for you to communicate in other ways or to do things, the same things in other ways. However, what we have seen over a period of time again has been with growing digitization digital only modes of services, right? There's sometimes just no alternative because the post office no longer exists. You have to go online and in your own experience, you would have found, ma'am ye link hai, or sir ye link hai, isme jaiye, or tab book kariye, ya tab OTP milega. So without the internet, that cannot happen, right? Matching with these trends of how the internet is also now much more, uh, uh, much more widely used than it was before. For instance, in a city like Delhi, there are, and I love to say the statistic, if you look at the T, firstly, we have the number of uh, internet connections which are made, uh, uh, the number of internet connections and the historical data on it, which is made available by two departments. The first is the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, okay, and the second is the Department of Telecom. The Department of Telecom publishes an annual report where you can look at it. And the TRA publishes two things. One is a quarterly uh, performance services evaluation report, and then there is a monthly report. There are some delays in that though. Okay, like uh, there'll be a three or four month delay. But what it's been showing consistently has been 
that there is a very high degree of saturation of the number of internet users, internet connection, sorry, not users, uh, in, uh, in urban areas like Delhi, where the number of connections actually are 257 to 264 for 100 people, which means there's 2.6 connections per person. But all these reports gather the number of connections against the recorded population rather than the number of individual users because that's much more tough to do yeah. and they're also counting corporate connections like a university right so it may end up meaning that the same person who's probably like me teaches in a university has an ipad has a laptop has a mobile phone has a wired connection back home because i want to stream a ott show or something like that Okay, ends up happening having access to five connections. But the person who comes to my house and helps me, okay, maybe sharing or rationing one smartphone for a two children and a husband, right? So there is a level of disparity which is there. However, it is undeniable in urban areas, the mobile phone is the primary method for accessing services. And what makes this clear? is you're young so maybe you didn't feel the need to get vaccinated as soon as uh, vaccines became available for the age group for 18 to uh, 38 right but the only way you could get vaccinated initially when you were between this age was by going on covid right and how can you go to covid internet right and this was the uh, at least in the northern regions of India, this was the this was the period of the second wave. This is the period when I could hear ambulances outside my flat. I see in East of Kalash, there are three uh, hospitals on that road: National Heart Care, uh, Spring Meadows. Uh, so I could hear hospital, uh, ambulances all the time. So the minute the vaccination was made available, I was playing fastest finger first to get a slot. Right? I wanted to save myself. I wanted to get my parents. My parents were vaccinated earlier, but also my friends. Right? Now, the same person who helps me, Sushmita Didi, she stays upstairs. Right? She has one cell phone. She's much younger than me, like 10 years, etc. But she has a full family. The first thing is, she did not, she could not access the website easily. Secondly, she had only one smartphone, which made them choose who got vaccinated first. Her or her husband. Right? Now, all of these inequities which exist in our society, I think become much worse when you take away the internet from people. I'm going to come to that, and I'm going to use the specific example of, firstly, the Nurada Basin case, which was litigated, okay? I was a part of that case, set the strategy. Then, some of the other internet shutdown cases which have taken place in India subsequently. Okay? But I'll just for a minute like to go back to Coven. So, if you look at Coven, Coven is today regarded as a success. Right? And undoubtedly, we have achieved a very high number of vaccinations. However, what is important to always understand is that vaccination usually rests on the principle of equity. That it should not be based on socio-economic rationing as much as the world does prejudice and prefer people based on socio-economic needs. Which means that, you know, there's statistical analysis which shows consistently because of COVID, more men got vaccinated first than women. There's data now. Why is that? Because, because more men have smartphones. Yeah. Why do more men have smartphones? Well, because yeah. society is yeah. Right? Now, if you rely on traditional vaccination methods, in addition to digital methods, which would be walk-ins, you would have these disparities. But also, Seva Kendra sometimes break down these inequities by going and doing outreach, by involving women as vaccinators itself. Right? So vaccine equity was not followed to a large extent. 
So we need to look at these numbers a little much more critically because the narratives we are told about technology are quite often that it does not discriminate, it does not see color, it does not look at gender, caste, etc. So it's very important to place it in a social, so sociological context because sometimes the values in technology actually reflect the values of society. It's just that we cannot judgment, we cannot question its judgment because computer ne bataya sir. Okay? So now I come to internet shutdowns. Potentially one of the longest issues I've been associated with and the most passionately even in the realm of legal practice has been internet shutdowns. The first case I did on internet shutdowns is in fact pre-IFF before Internet Freedom Foundation. So there was a, I used to run this blog called the India Law and Technology blog. Okay, that's because there were not many blogs which were on law and technology, not because I was wanted to claim India and law and technology for me. Okay, this was in 2009. So there were a lot of younger lawyers who when started looking at these issues and the younger generation, I mean, being digital natives knows the value of technology much more better than people who are older, who always thought that, no, yaar, yeah, social media, this, this all nonsense, etc. Justice Chandrachud is changing it, but like uh, before it, five or six years before it, if you watch, a lot of people were saying technology is bumped up. Okay, so one of the younger lawyers from Gujarat reached out, and this was around the time there were Patidar agitations for reservation. Uh, and the state government was shutting down the internet again and again, again and again. Okay. It is not that this was only happening in Gujarat. This was happening in other places as well. And one young law student, God of Suresh Bhai Vyas, happened to file a petition in the High Court of Gujarat saying that, hey, you're shutting down the internet in Ahmedabad, Surat, Balodra, repeatedly, again and again, under these orders, sometimes using powers under Section 144 of the Code of Criminal Procedure or Section 52 of the Telegraph Act. So, why can the why is the why is the court shutting down the internet repeatedly rather than blocking specific websites, specific posts? Because there's a lot of reliance people have on the internet. I think this was sometime in 2018. The Gujarat High Court negated his argument, okay, and it held that this was a lawful exercise of power because it was based on police inputs, okay was to prevent violence and it was proportional because it shut down mobile internet access but permitted wired internet access. Now what is proportionality? The principle of proportionality emerges from the constitution of India saying you have part 3 which says you have these fundamental rights. Each citizen has this fundamental right. Okay? So you must have heard about the fundamental right to freedom of speech and expression. You must have about heard some person on a late night talk show say, we all have the fundamental right to freedom of speech, but it is not absolute. You have duties, right? So let us understand how can the right be limited, right? We'll come to duties later. So the part three, the structural design of fundamental freedoms for instance under article 19 is that you have a right because the state has been made to give you a right. Why is that? I hope my friend Gautam talked about it a little here. We come from a experience of being a colonized people by an imperial force, right? Of living under the uh, jackboot of the British, right? So why did the independence uh, what is what is the meaning of independence? Why was the freedom struggle done if he couldn't get rights? So that is why there is a fundamental right to freedom of speech and expression, which is the principle. And then the limitation is there as any reasonable restriction. Now people will say what is reasonable and what is not, and this is where proportionality becomes important. Because quite often your friends who are not lawyers will say that, let's agree to disagree. I can say XYZ from ABC community is so and so and so, which may be a form of hate speech, right? And you may say, 
No, that's not free will speech and expression. And your friend may say, who will decide? Right? So there is always a contested boundary of what is reasonable. But it is at these points in time, legal doctrines such as proportionality helps us decide what is a right and what is the limit of that right. And it, this comes through when the state makes a law prohibiting the right. So proportionality as a doctrine emerges much more first in the Indian Supreme Court from cases such as modern dental, banning of uh, like Khulja industries. So basically if you look at it, sometimes there are, there are arguments which are made which are, which are used in commercial matters which use public interest litigation or public law in some way. For instance, in Khulja Industries, there is a contractor, the state government or the central government gives them a contract. The contractor supplies them defective project, products or cheats the government. And it's admitted the contractor has actually committed a default on the contract. Now imagine it's for textbooks. The exams are delayed. There's a huge public injury. Of course, you will impose damages, but all procurement contracts also have this one clause of blacklisting. What that means is that you as a contractor can't come again and then enter the bidding process. Because you, you have a bad record, boss. You've made us delay the state board examinations because you didn't give us proper materials, the paper which you provided was inferior for instance, right? Now Kulja industry says the penalty should be proportional, which means that the value of the supply order which is there, the penalty should be commensurate to the market rate which the state government needed to conduct the examination. The delay, the costs and some bits of penalties in addition to that to make sure there's a deterrent. It can't be limited. You can't cause the other person to foreclose their business. And even when you blacklist them, it can't be there for eternity. Okay? Even crimes have a period of imprisonment. Right? So proportionality means that you have to reason whatever is the imposition of the disability which is visited by law. But in the context of fundamental rights, it means a little different. So, what we see with proportionality is, for instance, in the right to privacy judgment, the KS Puttaswami judgment, where the Aadhaar project was upheld, yeah. but the Supreme Court limited it. It said that when you gather information for someone, it has to be linked to a purpose. You can't ask it just because you want to ask it. You have to ask that information only when it is necessary, which means that if you can do that purpose without asking that information, well, go ahead, do it. It must be proportional. You can't ask for everything. You can't install cameras everywhere when all you want to do is ask their name, the roll number for the purposes of verifying their identity. So gather the least amount of information. Keep it proportional to the activity. Okay? And in the context of internet shutdowns, it can mean a lot of things. Why is that? Internet shutdowns, even when imposed, coming back to Gujarat, in terms of a shutdown on mobile internet versus fixed line, is the way the court frames it. But here's the thing, most people in India, especially from lower socio-economic groups, like Sushmita Didi, only has access to internet on her mobile phone. We are a mobile only market. All our government bureaucrats say we are in the boom time of a geo-revolution. And what is the geo-revolution? It is through the smartphone. It is not through fiber access. Right? Secondly, what is proportionality should also be considered in the context of the prior president of the Supreme Court on freedom of speech and expression. Which says that you can only limit that speech which is illegal or proximate to illegal speech as a preventive censorship measure. What does this mean? So there's a famous quote from a judgment of the Supreme Court. 
and since Diwali is coming, it's an apt metaphor. It's from Jagjeevan Ram, S. Jagjeevan Ram, which says that the proximity is very important, so it should be like a spark to a powder keg. And spark to a powder keg results in an explosion, right? Okay? So, uh, essentially, the Supreme Court is saying there needs to be a degree of proximity whenever you are prohibiting or pre-censoring speech. Which also means that if you shut down the internet, the internet is not only being used for people to make statements which may link to why the internet was shut down. In Gujarat it was shut down because of the Patidar agitation, but also because of one uh, procession during Ganesh Chaturthi where the police claimed that they needed to shut down the internet for two days because violence could happen. Well, if violence could happen, why did the police not deploy more police people there? Nakas were not set up. Why were permissions given for the procession then? If there's a more importantly, why did you shut down the internet rather than essentially ensuring that the internet could also be used in a manner which was constitutionally consistent by sending advice building citizen trust and in case there were instances in terms of any kind of incitement to act swiftly upon them to prosecute them right to actually firstly look at how to prevent the spark in the powder powder keg without prohibiting a festival celebration itself which involves fireworks right so the argument for proportionality against internet shutdowns is not that you are allowing wired access versus wireline access, wireless access, types of access or types of websites. And I've written an op-ed about this also in the Indian Indian Express, which is about limited internet shutdowns. They say that let's just shut it down in one district. Let it sh shut down for two hours, four hours, six hours. Let us just shut down on wireline versus uh, wireless or let us just uh, try to shut it down uh, uh, for a category of websites or permit a category of websites which are called essential websites. So I say these four different methods of limited inter shutdowns are all disproportionate because I go back to where I started from. What is the internet? The internet is in a way a very essential environmental necessity today for human function. Let us recognize that for many people today to function properly or to achieve the uh, best potential as a human, they require access to the Okay, so proportionality with respect to speech and the internet needs to thus be considered in the in the wider context of <coughs> the internet permitting speech which should presume to be legal, the internet by itself being a wider conception rather than a small minority and a preventive measure which is made to prohibit internet based communications even in one district, even only on wireline, even when permitting 150 to 200 websites for mobile banking will not be proportionate. Because what will be blocked off is potentially billions of bits of information as well as access which people require. Now the constitutionality of internet shutdowns have not been determined by the Supreme Court of India till date. That is because it has not been per se challenged. What have been challenged have been specific orders for internet shutdowns and practices and safeguards which have been asked for. So if you read the Anuradha Basin judgment, it will say that the petitioners have not raised these. And you may think, why would why would you not make that case? Why would you not claim everything? And this is a very important practical lesson. 
you should only ask for something when you know you have a chance of getting it sometimes or you improve your bargaining position when you ask it for the next time right but if you ask for something and you are refused and that becomes precedent and you know that's going to happen does that work to your benefit no nahi na matlab mummy papa se kuch itni badi demand rakh do to aur tumhe pata hai ki that we side it will you do that day goofy especially in front of your siblings you never do that right you'll get paid for the rest of your life from your sibling actually okay that's so important so the jammu and kashmir internet shutdown occurred in the wider context of a decision to revoke article 370 and to make it at that point in time a union territory which was i think august 5 if i'm not wrong and the first shutdown essentially was of all telecommunications wireline uh, phone services itself were not working and they were not working in all the districts of jammu kashmir and ladakh jammu also not only kashmir okay and the orders which were there for internet shutdown initially were not published initially were not made available and this not only happened in gujarat or jammu and kashmir this also happened in rajasthan this has also happened in bihar right it's a pan india problem and i'll come to that a little later but firstly what's the code what does it do so anuradha was seen who is the editor of kashmir times files a petition and that's her petition but there are other bodies as well which file it the arguments here are we challenge the legality of the orders which have been passed by the government for internet shutdowns show us the orders because any restriction on fundamental rights needs to be proportional you need to disclose what were the reasons why you shut down the internet and why you continue to do so because this is not like the internet shutdown in badodra surat or amdavad which was for two days or three days this is running right people are incurring massive economic loss massive loss of opportunity they can't prepare for competitive examinations nor participate in them journalists can't report at a moment of important historical significance as to what's happening within jammu kashmir and ladakh how are the people reacting to the revocation of a constitutional article right irrespective of where you stand on your politics shouldn't the government at least tell you the reason why it has shut down the internet and all communications and why that you should do so right so we filed the case challenging the orders but we didn't have the orders and this is not usually there the second thing is when the solicitor general appeared in court and you check transcripts they refused to give the orders and ultimately when they did so they gave it in seal cover so the first fight actually was rather than determining the legality of the order it was just to get the order even filed in court in the right way possible and get transparency okay but i think the solicitor general is not far off from the institutional response to internet shutdowns because only 5 years ago i come back to the gujarat high court case gorav suresh bhai vyas as a state of gujarat i filed a like the the person filed a slp in the supreme court and i argued it before justice ts thakur and he said security agency should have the uh, should have the uh, discretion to shut down the internet whenever they want and they rejected the petition the arguments on it were held for about uh, about uh, 15 to 20 minutes and my argument actually was not against internet shutdowns my argument was if there is a specific power under the telegraph act which is section 52 how can you exercise a general power under section 144 which is to prohibit certain forms of conduct and 
Section 144 is a general curfew bar under the Code of Criminal Procedure. In fact, historically it's been used to even confiscate Gandhi caps of our independence day, like independence uh, uh, freedom fighters. So, more or less, when you look at it, the argument which I made was that Section 52 of the Telegraph Act allows for the interception, suspension of any telegraph communications. That's the bar which is used. But you're also using Section 144, and how can you use 144 if a more specific bar is there? And there's a legal maxim you may study specific overrides the general, yeah. right? If there are two branches of law which intersect on the same theme. Okay? And, uh, okay, I'm arguing a little too much about it, like I lost the case. <laughs> <laughs> but I think. The Solicitor General was only voicing what I heard in that same courtroom a few years ago, right? And of course, time has changed so much. This is a better understanding of what internet access means. Or maybe at that point in time, in 2018 and 19, I myself as an early user of the internet felt a greater emotional connection than others did. But imagine that even a state high court cannot take e-filing in Manipur properly or their litigants can check the case listing and that happened in uh, the Jammu and Kashmir High Court as well. So, if you look at the Anuradha Basin judgment, it actually upholds the principle of special and general subsequently without it even being argued. The second thing was that if section 5.2 applies, the argument which was made in that case also Gaurav Suresh Bhai Vyas was that you need to have a procedure. You can't have only a power anchored in a provision of the Telegraph Act without a procedure defined how the executive authority will exercise it. For instance, if you look at telephone tapping, which flows from section 5.2 as well. So the power to tap telephones has been there under section 5.2 of the Telegraph Act for eternity. But there was a very interesting political controversy and exposure which led to a case called the telephone tapping case. Okay, PUCL versus Union of India. Where the Supreme Court held if you don't have a procedure defined to tap telephones, it will always be abused. So you need to record reasons, you need to have a review committee, and till you make this, this procedure, we define it here. And that is section, that is rule 419A of the telegraph rules. Okay, so the thinking was that you can't, you don't use section 144, you only use section 52 and then you have rules under it, okay, so that limits some amount of abuse. But according to me, internet shutdowns are per se abuse because they are disproportionate. However, in any kind of strategic litigation advocacy which you see, in which there is there's an inherent power which is vested with the government to exercise discretion. You quite often win that through institutional processes over years and incrementally. You first try to chip it and limit to transparency, to procedure, to a process. And then you come in later points of time to say that, hey, even the procedure is not working. The problem is not the actual action which is being taken by an executive authority or a person. The problem is not that the, the exercise of the power is bad, the power itself is bad. And that only comes through experience. People recognize and acknowledge that only through experience, especially people who hold that power. Okay, it's not working out, let's give up on this. Let's give up on internet shutdowns. What else can we do, right? So, in Anuradha Basi, we then eventually get the orders in sealed covers. We argue even on those internet shutdown orders. We go through the orders. However, the court only sticks to prescribing certain safeguards. And those safeguards are transparency, constitute a review committee, and all orders in Jammu and Kashmir which have been passed will be reviewed again by the same authority which passed it. The internet shutdowns continue. Two or three more cases are filed again. Foundation for Media Professionals, you can look it up. I'm the lawyer again. 
And we keep going back to court saying that it's still there, it's still there, it's still there. And one day, there's a story by CNN. Rihanna tweets it out and the internet is restored in two districts. And slowly it's restored in. So my friends say that, like, yeah, okay, Abar, maybe you should have just, like, you know, like, some of them were kind of impressed because I have is good today, that's the end story. But, like, I sometimes think, uh, it made me think and brings me back to IFF also, why we think that social change is not only rested on the courts and quite often for constitutional change to happen, civic literacy, advocacy is important. But uh, yeah, my friends try tend, tend to joke and say that, like, yeah, he went to the court, he spent so much time, he wasted paper. Okay, so yeah, uh, I hope you get used to that as lawyers, but it comes with the power we have. So. What happened after the Anuradha Basin judgment is another one of the big faults which happens a lot of times with the rights based litigation is the implementation of the judgment. Right? So the internet is not restored in Jammu and Kashmir. In fact, the government tries to do different things. It tries to do an allow list approach. It says that we'll permit 250 websites for access, and these 250 websites will be the same websites, like banking, right? Like uh, like uh, two or three government portals, state government portals, central government portals, uh, Ayush Health Scheme, things like that. Turns out it doesn't work. Because if you go to at one web page, it is pulling elements from 50 to 60 servers and the web page is not only made for the people in Jammu and Kashmir. Right? A lot of them happen to be serving a global audience or at least a pan-India audience. And nobody is going to then get into a further technicality of these will be the elements from these servers we will pull, these AWS puppets, this will be the IP addresses and keep it static. That's just not possible. So it didn't work. So allow this also doesn't work. Right? And anyways, it's like very rational internet by itself. Ultimately, what ha ends up happening is that state governments do end up publishing more orders than they would otherwise. Because they realize if you don't publish an order and shut down the internet, people can take us to court. And publishing an order actually doesn't really cause us a lot of problems, right? In fact, most of, most of, most of the people you may meet, or even most of the people in this room, I say, if someone has to go to the internet, if we close the internet, then you will close it. People will say. And I understand this. I completely understand this. In fact, I would support them. I would also think that if shutting down the internet can help prevent the loss of one life, then shut it down. But is there a correlation or is there a causation due to the internet? And that's a very important thing to understand. And second, is it proportional? Is shutting down the internet also causing the loss of life? Because a person cannot possibly avail healthcare services in a timely fashion. Do you have, do you have grandparents who are really old and who can't go to a hospital? Yeah. Do you have people who now sometimes in your family if they do have a a uh, cell phone, do a WhatsApp video call with their doctor instead of going there and may not actually do it regularly because they'll just cheat on it. Right? These are very human things. So we have to think through the perspective and the lens of evidence. So there's one report which also shows it's not only a Jammu and Kashmir problem, which has been done, in fact, excluding Jammu and Kashmir. Because a lot of the work was done only on Jammu and Kashmir prior to that. And we didn't make the argument that internet shutdowns are per se unconstitutional because Jammu and Kashmir, if you look at precedent or national security, our worst rulings from the Supreme Court have come on national security, where constitutional principle seems to get into a fuzzy line where the court may, when judging the constitutionality of TADA, may say that it's unconstitutional, but you just add over reasonably. But you create this notional procedure, where a much more senior bureaucrat 
oversees the decision which is taken by a junior bureaucrat. All the while forgetting that maybe a junior bureaucrat on a very politically sensitive decision will pick up the phone or go into the office of the senior bureaucrat and ask him, Sir, kya karu? So the instruction has come already and it's been confirmed by the same people. Right? So there's an absence of third party scrutiny, oversight, and we have to think about the judiciary much more critically from the perspective of where it varies from the implementation of our fundamental rights under the Constitution of India. This is important. This is also important because quite often the judiciary is criticized for a whole range of, act, of, of actions which are today emerging from what Professor Mohan Gopal calls theocratic values. Values which come from any religious book rather than the Constitution of India. I won't get into that. But I would encourage you to go to live law and look at Professor Mohan Gopal's lecture on theocratic values in judicial decision making. Okay? So, coming back to the report, what it shows is that Anuradha Basin as a judgment has not been able to successfully be implemented. It is a joint report by Human Rights Watch and Internet Freedom Foundation which empirically gathered data on the basis of RTIs, gathered it and statistically analyzed it. It's titled, No Internet Means No Work, No Pay, No Food. Internet shutdowns deny access to basic rights in digital India. It's dated June 14, 2023. You may ask, why no work, no pay, no food? Because the attempt has been to show that even in rural communities, the impacts for the deprivation of the internet quite often are very, very severe. We are living in a digitized form of entitlement and beneficiary support architecture which has been created in digital India. What that means is that quite often people who rely on pensions, subsidies uh, and any kind of entitlements or biometric verification for them getting their rations need access to the internet guys or the much talked about gig economy or the much talked about tourism industry in Rajasthan for instance right UPI payment kaise karoge petrol kaise bharwaoge okay and and tens of thousands of things so let me just come to the data I'm quoting now, Human Rights Watch and Internet Freedom Foundation identified 127 shutdowns in three years between the Supreme Court's Anuradha Basi judgment in January 2020 and December 31st, 2022. So this data is of December 2022. Okay? Of 28 Indian states, 18 shut down the internet at least once in the three years. The takeaway being, this is not only a problem for Jammu and Kashmir or Gujarat, it's a pan-India problem. Local authorities use internet shutdowns in 54 cases to prevent or in response to protests. Protests per se are not illegal. Protests essentially are also attempts by people to collectively organize and peacefully demand action because they lack power. There's a person sitting in a building who holds power. Ordinary people gather and picket and demand their rights. That's the basis how women have gotten voting rights. How everyone today has working hours. Uh, at least the notion of a minimum wage. It's all happened due to picketing, protesting, organizing, and the Constitution of India recognizes it. Okay? But the underlying legal justification for an internet shutdown is to prevent a protest which is planned in advance. And quite often, these protests which are done require police permissions. So what happens when you give a police permission? <coughs> Not only is the police permission not given, in fact there is no clear no given, the internet is shut down. Okay? 
And each place is not Dehradun, it's not Bombay, it's not Delhi, it's not Bangalore. We need to remember how things and law and order works beyond the big metropolitan cities. And why people sometimes feel the need to organize. And they organize in very creative ways. For instance, there was there was a protest by farmers before the farm protest. In fact, these were simmering, this was simmering discontent which should have been dealt with properly by inviting them for conversation. If you go online and you'll check, there was a form of protest because people couldn't collect outside government offices in Uttar Pradesh in which potato farmers were basically dumping potatoes. Basically, they used to get a truck, open the truck in front of a government office and run away. And tomatoes uh, and potatoes used to be there. Yeah, as you can imagine, what happened was arrests. Okay, but protest essentially means somebody really is dissatisfied, and groups of people are coming together. And what shutting down the internet quite often does is that it takes away a democratic pressure wall, which means that. When the pressure cooker has a lot of hot steam in it, it can't blow off the lid. And what happens to a pressure cooker, which is on a constant boil, without the ability to let off steam? It bursts, and there's violence. And this is not a mere statement I'm making. There's a researcher by the name of Jan Razdak, who's authored a paper called Of Sieges and Shutdowns, Of Protests, Bunds, it's on SSRN, I'll give the link. And he says, he studied data. And he says that if you take away the ability for people, not only to physically organize, but also digitally protest, they resort to much more violent forms of action. And after all, a lot of people say, the internet is for people who just want to sit in a corner, sulk and stream movies. So, right? Oh, your favorite show, Binge, right? So I think it will result in a little less violence if people have access to the internet in a given place. In fact, they may be able to pass a longer amount of time even if they are surrounded by violence. Okay. And 37% to prevent cheating in school exams. <laughs> Guys, if you have access to the entire library and there's a really good paper which is set, do you think it will make you move? feel more confused? Will you have difficulty completing your papers properly? Like it may help you reach the average in the pass score. Will it help you excel if you don't prepare? And what does it mean to prevent cheating in exams? Let me tell you what happened in Rajasthan. Okay. Rajasthan I really like. <laughs> I'll tell you why also. Because Rajasthan has a Jan Suchna portal. Rajasthan actually makes, you can raise a complaint and a ticket is given and they actually do address it, senior bureaucrats do. They're really sincere about their work. And even when they shut down the internet, they approve every order there. So when you talk to a bureaucrat and you say, Sir, you have to school exam. Ke se kari. Kehte, Kyunki hum sare order publish karte we are being penalized for our transparency. Look at other states of art. So I said, no sir, I'm going to use you as an example and also say this. Okay, so I'm being honest here. They are potentially, at least when it comes to digital transparency, incredibly high. It's easy to get orders of administrative decisions, what happens in Rajasthan, right? But it's also telling or maybe representative of what's happening in other parts of India, right? So in Rajasthan, you have recruitment examinations for different kinds of safe services like teachers, like police services, which come under the state government, which are called recruitment exams. Thereby the central government, the armed forces, the state governments. And great stable jobs for people who come from agrarian backgrounds, who are making a certain incremental form of social advance for the first time in their life. They have a desk job. It's a dream for a lot of people who come from agrarian backgrounds, right? And for that, they 
take loans, study in quota-like environments, which are very unquota-like, okay, for one or two years. The exam dates are not confirmed, they are postponed because the state government is holding its own exams. You have to think like that, right? And quite often these papers are leaked. So it is a real concern. And then you can understand why do they shut down the internet. Such learned bureaucrats, really respectable, fine people. To them, it would be, it would cause the delay of six months of a young person's life from when they can get a job, which they have been dreaming about for years. But let's see if it's effective. So Rajasthan cancels the uh, one state teacher's exam. I monitored this. I wrote about it in Rajasthan Patrika also. Uh, not a teacher's, a police, some policing exam. And the admit card for the exam actually had to be, uh, was on the mobile. So they had to download it in advance. They sent an SMS that downloaded one day in advance at least. Because we're shutting down the internet when the exam will happen. They did the exam. The paper still leaked. <laughs> and they did it again. And it still leaked. Happened thrice. And yet it continues. I'll come to the reasons also why I think this keeps happening. And why it happens for different reasons. So, and... 18 in response to communal violence and 18 for other law and order concerns. Now, I have very clear defined views on communal violence, but I won't speak about them here because I don't speak about it in educational institutions. It helps prevent a certain degree of uh, acrimony which can creep in. And you find the conversation a little much more pleasant and hopefully you like me a little as well. You can guess what they are, I write about it. Okay, and I have a YouTube channel, you can look there, but not here. Okay, this is an educational institution. So, if you look at the evidence of internet shutdowns, this problem is then brought to the notice of the standing committee of IT. So, Parliament has standing committees which study topics of legislation and give reports which are tendered to Parliament. Now, you all think that possibly Parliament doesn't do its job, our legislators are have criminal antecedents, they are really lazy, etc., things like that. I would like you to look at the report by the Standing Committee on IT on Internet Shutdowns. It's an excellent, excellent report. And in that report, it essentially says, our primary recommendation, it has eight recommendations, and it says one of our recommendations is, if you're shutting down the internet, have you collected the data? And then have you done a study as to its potential benefits in actually preventing the communal violence or preventing the law and order issue or preventing the cheating or yeah, preventing the public protest, that will be successful. But yeah, so have you been successful in the legitimate state objectives which you stated were part of the internet shutdown? What losses economic, social, financial were caused due to internet shutdowns? And why, despite the Supreme Court's judgment in Anuradha Basin, there's no centralized repository of internet shutdown orders which are tracked by the central government. The Department of Telecom and Ministry of Home Affairs first refuse. Say, we don't have this data, we can't do this, state governments pass these orders. Standing committee says, no, you do it. Because the Telegraph Act is your law. You have made the Telegraph suspension rules. Can't you add one rule there? Each order has to be sent to the Home Secretary, right? And one should always remember, you have the Crime in India report by the National Crime Records Bureau of India, right? What is that? It collects all the FIRs from all the states which send it and they have an elect electronic common system in most states which has been implemented by the Ministry of Home Affairs actually. So it's a half truth to say that this is law and order is a state subject, we won't touch it. You won't touch it because it's inconvenient, right? So then you have the action taken report. So after the standing committee gives a report, 
it realizes that things don't happen by themselves. And then it gives an action taken report in again which the Ministry of Home Affairs and the Department of Telecom says that we won't do it. And the, there are words which are used like we admonish, surprising, shocking. This is on February this year. And this year, in February, I think Dr. Shashi Tharoor was not the chairperson. And in parliamentary standing committees, you don't wear the party hat. You're non-partisan in that sense. So this is the this is the harm of internet shutdowns, which is unexamined. So when you look at proportionality, you're going to say what objective can you actually fulfill with the least amount of disturbance to the right which exists. But what if the activity itself, the legitimate state objective itself is not being fulfilled by an internet shutdown? And here, we always seem to forget there is a power for the government to block specific websites for specified periods of time under section 69A of the Information Technology Act. It is not as if other sensorial powers do not exist. So if you say, WhatsApp say, Dange ki baat phail rahi hai, chandra tenle WhatsApp an karlo. But do it as per a public, published order which is transparent and reviewed at frequent opportunities given that people will also use WhatsApp to tell their family where they are that they are safe, okay? I don't know about you, but anything wrong happens in any court in Delhi. You may have seen recent videos of lawyers acting, maybe like lawyers, okay? <laughs> yeah? And my mom was like, tum, tum court ho, na? <laughs> But see, I think and you know, I was on an NDTV show once, Sarah Jacob was hosting it, and there was a person, there was a DM from Jharkhand, Jharkhand also shuts down the internet, and he was saying, we have actually prevented loss of life in this guy. There was a person there, who in the audience interaction, they used to have this show called Be The People, he said, I am from Ranchi, my family thought I was dead for eight hours. <laughs> and we will laugh about it, but he <coughs> went into detail how they behaved. They call their relatives to go and visit and check local hospitals. This is what happens. The complete situation of panic. Right? Especially in Indian families. And in that panic, a lot of things can happen. So again, I think there's inadequate basis to show this. I think the most recent demonstration of this is through the internet shutdown in Manipur. Is the violent ethnic conflict taking place due to the internet or are there deep historical divisions? Is there a lack of political accountability in which a mighty Indian state which can build highways in two years on a bed, on, on, a, on a river bed here to their own, hopefully it will be done by March, which has such the second, I think the third or the second largest standing army in the world can't restore peace. The mighty Indian state can't do it today. I think it can. Why is there no political accountability? Do we, do we think shutting down the internet and continuing it will help solve the situation? And also, did us did did most of us just ignore it till a viral video came out, which was shot in fact on May 3rd or May 4th itself? May 4th itself? And would our urgency and our concern about what happening in Manipur not driven a higher level of accountability? So, it's not as if the internet is positive in a sense, but it does help improve transparency, right? And especially for regions like Manipur, whose total population is, I think so, about 2.8 million, 2.4 million. It's a small place in that sense. Delhi has, I think so, about 20 million people. Staying here. Right? But it is uh, incredibly dangerous as well as dehumanizing for them to know 
that there's a lack, there's a national apathy which surrounds it. And here there's a complete institutional failure, not only by the state executive or the union executive, it is also there of the judiciary. I've written three op-eds on this. The first one was in the Hindu. The first one was uh, in the Hindu. The second one, I think so, was in Indian Express, and then again in the Hindu. Or like, I've written three. I've gone through bits of the information which I've lectured about today. But one final thing, and which is the last part of this lecture I'd like to talk about, which is this notion of limited internet shutdowns, which appeals, it's very seductive. It's so seductive because it says, we have to make a reasonable difference, guys. We have to allow the good while blocking out the bad. And we have the power to do that. So people can get the internet, but for good things, for peace, for togetherness and harmony. And who will decide that? The state government. But who comes up with this idea, guys? It's the High Court of Manipur. So, after the internet shutdown has been there, by about May 19th or 20th, petitions come to be filed challenging the imposition of the internet shutdown in the High Court. The High Court, when hearing the petitions, issues notice, calls for the state government to provide a reply and says that there's an extremely disturbed situation here. We do want to allow the internet, but we'll defer to the state government. And this is the template, if you remember, which is also being set by the Supreme Court, because in Anuradha Basin, it did not judge the legality of even one order. Hey, I'm okay if you say the order is legal or illegal, but at least say it when we are challenging it, right? Give us an answer. Tell us how we are wrong. Why avoid it completely? Because judicial review as a power of executive authority and orders passed from the Telegraph Act does exist with the courts. If you want to reason, it floods the courts with too many cases. Reason it, state it. Right? Even though a review committee exists, there still needs to be the availability of real jurisdiction. So again, coming back to this High Court, I say that it follows the institutional grammar which has been set by the Supreme Court in Anuradha Basin, where it does not judicially review the orders for internet shutdowns which are passed. And then the High Court by itself, in subsequent hearings, says that restore wireline internet access for government institutions, T1 lines, which are lease lines, in which and give undertakings in which VPNs, social media websites, etc., all of that is blocked. And it says these are limited internet provision till you can settle the conflict. But it's at that time going on for three months. Then there's a wider case in the Supreme Court. The state government says we have shut down the internet and this will result in the violence coming down. Then subsequently, the state government also says uh, that in the High Court that if we restore partial internet, even on mobile, it will lead to violence. But the High Court says, why don't we do this? People will come to you, they'll fill up an application, and then you decide if they should get mobile-based internet access. But it doesn't specify any norms. You select the numbers, you monitor it, etc. It's your job. And you will also block all these websites, which you think, whichever ones you would want to block. You can directly convey that, because we don't have the capacity, to the internet service providers. So today, we don't know the process under which a person can get mobile-based internet access in Manipur. We do not know what websites are blocked and what are permitted. We do not know which regions are being allowed or not being allowed, which type of access, but mobile internet access is blocked in all the districts. <coughs> and it continues to do so. At the same point in time, the chief minister of the state keeps tweeting pictures and has disabled all replies on Twitter. Okay, and this can happen with other chief ministers and other state governments as well, going back to the IFF HRW study. Okay. Now, we must think from a very objective position of our experience of settling
conflicts in the Northeast. Here, the former Home Secretary G.K. Pillai says for normalization, the primary strategy is of de-escalation, where the period between the last event of violence and the next event of violence needs to be extended, where you go from 8 hours to 12, from 12 to 24, from 24 to 48, and then you gradually de-escalate. It is not through shutting down the internet. Because guess what? If you broker a false peace, right? And a video comes out tomorrow and day after when the internet is fully restored, and it will be. You can't keep it shut down the entire life, right? And I think there have been two spikes already. One was uh, concerning a person. Uh, two, two young women from the Koki Zo community and much more recently from the Mighty community. So this will keep happening. I think what's needed is for the state response to focus on trust building, de-escalation of conflict, ensuring a higher level of dialogue between different communities and trust building, but it can only happen through a greater level of accountability on the large issue rather than focusing on the I'd like to end this lecture by coming back to moot court competitions. So you may think that in moot court competitions, you are quite often also advancing a very absolute position which you build into the brief. But I will give you a, 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 a insight or a, what you'd like to call a hack. The ones the moot court competitions in which you will do best actually will be the ones where you master the brief, know with each line of the compromise or the fact statement and can actually guide a judge with confidence by actually having a conversation with them. And the conversation is a conversation of the law. It's not driven from opinion and commentary. You need to have a conversation rather than blandly state sentences from a teleprompter. A moot court is to develop your qualities of persuasion. And today, how I stand before you and speak with such degree of confidence on a subject is of course due to my training in moot courts, but also the actual knowledge of the domain of work that I have undertaken over a considerable period of time. I've done this work, right? And moot courts are not the start and end of everything but they are important, so do participate in it, complement it with legal writing, okay? And finally, I'll tell you, I went to Amity, right? So I went to a lot of these moot courts with all these nationals, but they were just coming up then. But even then, there was a sense of discrimination, right? In the sense of, you always felt that sometimes you're not treated fairly, you were treated poorly. But a lot of it is in your mind also at least in these competitions, that's the first thing. And it's in your mind because you quite often think that we lose. Honestly, have that conversation with yourself because you can beat them. I've beaten NLS, Nalsar kids, like left, right and center. In most of these wars. They've defeated them. Sometimes they're privileged, they have access to seniors and they don't work that hard as you will. And a big secret about them is that a lot of them faff. They don't know their stuff. Okay. But my best friends also happen to be for me. So I don't know. Okay? Thanks. So before we get into QA session, uh, I just uh, I'll just remind you who whoever asked the boldest question will get boldest. boldest. Yes. 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 Not best, boldest. Then you answer. Okay, so we'll get a book, uh, namely uh, 10 judgments that changed India by Jia Modi and will be signed by Amar Gupta Sir. No, I can't sign her book. I'll get a picture with them, but I'm, I can't sign okay. her book. So, yes. Uh, Good morning, sir. So, I have two questions. Like, sir, is it required to have a complete code on, code on the internet shutdown? Like we have in CRPC, so it is required to have a complete code, exhaustive code on internet shutdown or not? And secondly, sir, you have said that many times government submits the sealed cover reports. So, sir, is it required for the Supreme Court to end this jurisprudence? Yes, sir. So, firstly, uh, 
the uh, legislative process which is underway is for review of the uh, telegraph uh, uh, telegraph act as the telecom bill which is called so the telecom bill is replicating section 52 it doesn't change anything it just changes the name of her majesty to central government which is already done previous so internet shutdown being replicated my view is uh, internet shutdown only require one section uh, there should be no complete suspension of internet services which shall be published under any time uh, any law for the time and then, like the internet sh uh, blocking power under Section 69 of the IP Act, you can make it a little much more limited, much more transparent, and a little much more uh, indiscriminate. I don't dispute the power of the government to shut down the internet. By the way, to give more people in exigent emergencies like war, okay? But then you have to spell out war, okay? You have to declare a formal declaration of emergency. So, more transparency is required. So, yes, threshold needs to be high. Secondly, like in terms of seed cover, I, I think there's like immense amounts of abuse. Uh, I have one of my favorite lines from Yes Minister is that the Official Secrets Act is not to protect secrets, it is to protect officials. So, what is the way forward for this? The way forward is to strengthen the RTI Act more and more. The way forward is for the judiciary to uh, basically. Uh, uh, remove the seat cover in more and more cases so the union executive or the state executive realizes that even if it's some instance seat cover it can be removed all of a sudden. Yeah. So I request all the people who are asking questions to so limit your questions to one and avoid cross questioning. We need to entertain a lot of people. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Sir, my question primarily is that a state has its primary responsibility to maintain sovereignty, public order, and public safety. But sir, the downfall of media is that it creates some opinions that be magnified against the state. That is to say that a controversial opinion can be formed. This is to say an example of Hamas and Israel. Hamas can either be considered a liberation group or a terrorist group according to the perspectives of the media. Now sir, my assumption is if not shutting down the internet, how exactly do you solve 